I know that our song leaders don't expect anybody to say all the time. Every time we meet, we appreciate their work. But making a little play on words, they are sometimes our unsung, appreciated brethren. And we do appreciate them for their efforts, for their learning, for their ability, and for their willingness to lead us in singing and in many times teach us new songs and teach us about songs and about music. And we appreciate that. We could spend quite a bit of time on the Bible teaching on the importance of music in the life of a Christian. Sometimes we don't think of it, but there's a lot said in the Bible. When you have the Psalms themselves being basically the Israelite songbook, and you have other psalms scattered throughout the Bible, then you realize that it does play a great part. When you read the book of James, he'll point out to you that if anybody's happy, let him sing psalms. Now, there's authority for each individual anywhere they are to sing psalms. Besides what's involved in the worship assembly as we worship him. I want to try to conclude what we started some time ago in Ephesians chapter 5, talking about some component parts of being faithful. I mentioned to you some time ago that we're taught to be faithful. How much is said about it? Well, it's a lot said about it. Our going to heaven depends upon whether we're faithful to the Lord or whether we're not in His church. So we want to be faithful. But that faithfulness covers a multitude of things. And we've been seeing some of that Paul gives us in what we have to his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 5. I want to again impress upon you, if you don't get anything else out of this, that is when he says, be ye, that's an imperative. It is a must. If be faithful is a must, then the component parts of being faithful are a must because it's these parts that put together that make the whole that is faithfulness so he says be ye therefore followers of God as dear children this is not something that we do while we're separated from God or we don't want to do it we don't care about it he says follow him as dear children let me ask you a question and then we're going to move on later in the chapter can you remember trying to keep up when you were just as early as you can remember, let's put it that way, after you were walking? I don't know how old that is, three, four, five. And you're trying to keep up with your daddy or your mother, trying to walk in their steps, trying to do your best, and you followed them as dear children. You want to keep up with them. You want to be with them. Now, I'm not saying there weren't times when you didn't, but I'm talking about the times when you did because of the attachment that there is there between father and child and child and father. Or parent, we could put right there. A desire to keep up, to be like them. For a while in this life, as innocent little children, the only God we know is our parents. They are our world. So when we come to be members of the church, the family of God, then we're to follow God as not just children. He says you're dear children. And that should make us realize God wants you to be in heaven with him. God's done all that deity can do to save us from our sins. He's loved us with a love that I frankly will tell you after all these years I can't grasp. We sing a song sometimes, so evidently a songwriter must have thought the same thing, uh, how he loves me so. Why does he love me so? That's something to ponder. Why does he love me so? Can't quite figure that one out. I can say something like, well, he fathered my spirit, so the imprint of God's upon me, but I still don't understand it. There's so many things that we can understand a little of, some of it we don't understand a lot of, some a little more than others, 
But far as fathoming really what's being said, I don't as to following God as dear children. I know these people heard the gospel sometime before this letter was ever written. It started in Acts 19 when it's recorded the church started in Ephesus of Asia. But they had heard the gospel, they had believed in Christ, they had repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, they had been baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. The Lord added them to the church. As I said in the beginning of this little study, we know more about the church at Ephesus than we do any other congregation in the New Testament. And we see then that what is being said here it's for our own good. But if you're a Christian, you already know some of these things, so why must he say it again? Because we have to. That's, that's also characteristic of being a child. That to be reminded. As Peter would, say, Peter would say, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Well, dear children have pure minds. They want to do what's right. They're following God in that way. Paul said, and we ended on this last week in Colossians 4 and verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. It's hard for us to understand the design and purpose of time as it relates to our development as Christians once we believe and obey the gospel. But time and space is the place God's chosen to test our faith in Him and our love of Him. And that time can either be used by carrying out the Lord's will and using our lives what He intended to get ready for eternity, or it can be just wasted away. That is, not used for any good purpose. We look here at verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And again, that's being cautious, careful, appreciating the time you have, I don't know who we are or how long you've been a member of the church. And that would be true if I was speaking to the whole of the church throughout the world at any one given time. But it's awful easy just to let time slip, slide away. I don't know why it's the way that it is, but when you're a young person, it just seems like you have forever and you turn around about twice maybe. <laughs> and you're not young anymore. And all those things that people you say about young people don't apply to you anymore. And you find yourself talking about them like people used to talk about you. And so we need to use time, redeeming the time, buying it back to serve God with. We wasted it too long in service to ourselves. So as members of the church, we recognize the days are evil, and we use these days in submission to the authority of Christ, Colossians 3.17, to be sure that we're what we ought to be. And in verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now you see then the connection with wisdom and understanding. Intellectually, we come to understand whatever the topic is that we're studying, whether it's history or whatever it may be. But then how to use knowledge? Well, remember, our time on earth is to prove to God we love Him. That we have faith in Him and His Son and the gospel system as to how He's chosen to save us from our sins. Thus, when we have that understanding, then we look at life in a wise way, or at least we should. Understanding is very important to becoming a Christian and living a Christian life. Now in chapter 3 of Ephesians, and we quote this passage most often, he said to them, Where, whereby when ye read, talking about the letter he's writing, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The reason the Bible, especially Paul, uses that term mystery so much is because the way, exactly the way God was going to save man was never revealed in the Old Testament they just couldn't figure out how a man under a law system and then violates that system could ever be saved by just God. 
Because the law system says you sin, you die. The law of sin and death. They couldn't conceive of God saying one of the Godhead three would become a man and therefore show man how God would live if he were here. That was not in their mind. So when Paul writes about the gospel, he says mystery, he means now it's revealed. You will know what I know as an apostle of Christ about the Christian life and all things that pertain to the scheme of redemption when you read the words I wrote unto you. You cannot overly emphasize the importance of reading the scriptures. But you read to understand. I know every one of us have done this. We've been reading something and then catch ourselves. We've read a paragraph maybe or a few sentences anyway, and we don't know what we read because our mind became occupied with something else. Something else got our attention. And we'd back back up and then begin where we remembered the last part and read it over again. Well, in walking the Christian walk, and he says a lot about that here, and using that terminology in living the Christian life, there are many times we may misuse our time and not intend to misuse it, but then we realize, I could have done better than that. Let's, let's try that all over again. Now, I know there's a few here that have played instruments of music, been in the band and orchestras and so forth. And I could not tell you how many times <laughs> that you play through a piece and the director would stop you and say, let's go back to point number B and let's start from there and let's go forward. And then usually give you some for the things, uh, trumpets, you have this here, you have this here. You're rushing it a little bit here, trombones or whatever, and you're, you're trying to get this right. People who never have played in an orchestra or the band don't know how many times when they see you in concert that you've gone over that stuff to the point to where you don't want to see it anymore. Well, that's when you're ready to perform. It's second nature to you. So when it comes to living the Christian life, we have one time through this life. And we're to use it not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time the days are evil. So that means we may start and say, oh, i got to back up and read this one over again. Well, if i got to redo this. And those of you who are builders, have you ever built something and got it just about done or completely done or on the way pretty well to finishing it, and you realize I can't, it won't work this way. I've got to start all over again and redo it. Everybody has that kind of thing. Well, God in his infinite love and mercy and grace and getting us ready for heaven has given us life to where we are in the land of beginning again. We're in the land of backing up and doing it again. That's part of growth and development. Now, it's not a land where you make a mistake and you say, I quit. <laughs> That's not what you do. You make mistakes, back up, and you hit it again. You can see that in the sports field where people are doing what they do. And you see the different ones, whether they're alignment or whatever they're doing, and over and over again they do what they're supposed to do. And it bothers me because we can see that so readily and easily in things of this world that are flippant and don't make that much difference and will not abide into eternity. And yet we can't realize how God saw fit to do it to shape our very souls into the likeness of Christ. So, he talks about it here. Wherefore, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Well, think about how many times in various letters from the different inspired penmen that type of, of thought is expressed. In some way or the other, he's always saying, review your life, look into the truth, study and restudy and re-restudy and re-re-restudy and pray and look back over it and back up and begin it again. And that's what you do all your life. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You keep on keeping on so that when Paul reached the end of his life, he says, I fought the good fight of faith. Well, that didn't mean he was flawless. That meant he was faithful and he never ceased to be trying to do better. Do you think the attitude that he expressed to the Philippians and forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You think that ever left him on this earth? He wouldn't have moved forward in, in living the Christian life if he had not kept that attitude. So we must too, and Paul wrote the Ephesians talking about the component parts of faithful living and says this is the way you do it and there is no other way to do it. 
And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, of course, there's two things here I want to emphasize. First of all, they were very familiar with drunks all over the place, as we are if you get in certain parts at certain times, of people drunk on alcohol some way or the other. He said, that's the way people are. He said, what should you do? What is your responsibility in this life to show God you understand the way that you're to use this life? Well, you be filled with the Spirit. Well, how is that possible? How is it possible to be filled with the Spirit? There are two things about that. One of them was, as Paul wrote this, he's writing part of the New Testament. So the whole New Testament has not been, at this time, committed to writing. Yet the whole doctrine of Christ was here. It was in the apostles and later transferred to a book. That's the way God saw fit to reveal the mind of Christ on this earth that we know is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the New Testament. So they had in those days, even as this is written, Paul's an apostle. He has all the miraculous powers of an apostle. There are those in the churches who have hands of apostles laid upon them, and they have the different miraculous gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, all nine of them. They could use them as they saw fit. Paul even told Timothy, don't neglect the gift that's in you by the laying on of my hands. So they could neglect it. They could abuse the very gifts that were miraculous because that's what they did among in the church in Corinth. And it took a letter from the Holy Spirit through Paul to tell them how they ought to use those gifts and use them properly. So they can be filled with the Spirit in that way in those times. It would be hard for me to think that living in those days, they wouldn't have that first and foremost on their mind when he said be filled with the Spirit. But there's the other part of it, and now he's writing a letter conveying the mind of Christ on these matters to them, and they're filled with the Spirit through the knowledge of God. And notice, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, look how it shows itself here. But be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's in the midst of a sentence that started back up here, what, in verse 15? And it's continuing on here. So be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Many times, and rightly so, we use this one in Colossians 3.16 to show that in the worship of God in music we sing. So, well, why can't you use mechanical instrument music or whistling or clapping hands or whatever else? That's not singing. Singing is a type of music. It's a kind of music. And it's the kind of music whereby you can make melody in your heart and you speak to yourselves. This is the reason that it's wrong to have choruses in the church, some singing and some listening. It doesn't forbid people getting together and singing in places and some people listening. It doesn't forbid that at all. What it does is say, when you assemble to worship God, everybody sings. And it limits it to that. Because we have other passages, as we said this morning, as James says, any of you are happy or cheerful, let him sing psalms. That's Bible authority for me singing a solo. But I am not authorized to sing a solo here and everybody else listen. I might, it might all run out the door if I started. But the point is, is that we need to rightly divide the word of truth on these matters. So the evidence of being filled with the Spirit in this case is speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The singing and making melody is where? In your heart. Well, he doesn't mean the blood pump. That's a muscle that's very important to us. But he's talking about the inward man of the Spirit. The heart strings are plucked. And when the heart strings are plucked, that's the soloing. The heart strings are plucked and the words are spoken. And the kind of words are spoken are spoken are psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Thus authority for us in worship to God in song, singing only, we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We do not sing a bridge over troubled water or something like that. We sing 
spiritual songs and psalms and hymns. Now, he says, that's the way you're doing. What are you evidencing? Get it in the context. What are you evidencing when you do this? You're evidencing being filled with the Spirit. Your mind's on spiritual things. You're being instructed, understanding what the will of the Lord is. You know what your life is. You know what it's all about in this life. You know how you use your life. And you manifest it in the joy that's there. How do I know that's the case? We have an example of it. The Ethiopian eunuch, a very devout person, returning from Jerusalem to worship under the law, it's all he knew, was taught the gospel of Christ by Philip the Evangelist and was baptized. And when he rose, he went on his way rejoicing. He could have very well, you realize, been singing as he went down the road, thankful to God that he was a child of the living God. His sins were remitted. He was a member of the church. Because that's the way we many times show our joy. And he's saying, here's how you do it here. Now he writes that to members of the church at Ephesus. He writes it as part of the New Testament. He writes it to you and to me. And notice what else is going on. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me impress this upon you if it hasn't already got there. That in the name of the Lord Jesus means by the authority of the King, by the authority of the Savior. That authority is manifest in the meaning of the words of the constitution of the church. What is it? His last will and testament, the New Testament. So as we sing, as we show forth our spiritual mindset, then we give thanks. Notice how singing and giving thanks it's put together. Giving thanks always. Not sometimes now and then, but always. Can you conceive of a time that Paul would not give thanks? Well, I think of times when he was being hurt, stoned, beaten, put in jail. And yet every account we have of him, not only in his instruction, but in his action, was he displayed joy. Counted it joy to suffer. That's what it says of the apostles not long after our Lord's death when they were being persecuted for righteousness' sake. It's a whole different outlook on life, a whole different disposition toward life. Notice, though, something else that may be the hardest part of this trio of verses to carry out. You show forth your spirituality in singing and in giving thanks and in all things. But then this next one, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Brethren, uh, we just don't like to submit one to another. Submit. That even has a bad sound to it. Submit. In the service, the armed services, People submit to superior officers. They may not like at all what they're commanded to do or authorized to do, but they're to submit all the things being properly equal. Then he gets really particular, and here's where hate speech, as far as some are concerned, comes out. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Should be quiet for a minute and let that sink in. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's so important to understand. It tells us why the home, one reason the home's in the big mess it's in today. The role of husband and wife has been turned upside down, wrong side out. And yet if you want this country or any other country any time in history to get itself on the right path, it's when the husbands do their part as the Lord directs them and the wives do their part. But notice the submit. Two times he says it. 
Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's Christians to one another. But then he says wives. He addresses them specifically. I guess it's just my curiosity, but I wondered when this letter would be written or be read to all the whole church. He's reading all this and all of a sudden wives. I wonder if people looked up. I really wonder if they did. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands. It is no wonder that in the feminist movement that has gone on now for years in the United States, that women should try to do what they've done in, quote, liberating themselves, unquote, and really simply shackling themselves to Satan. I'm not talking about a husband having the right to abuse his wife. That's sinful. It'll send him to hell as fast as anything else. I am talking about in the order of things as God gave him. The husband is the head of the house. And when all is said and done, all other things being scripturally equal, she is to submit to her own husband. And she's to use her submission to him or to the Lord as the way she submits to him. That would change so many things because, notice, for the husband is the head of the wife. My pages stick together. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Let those words sink in and the context in which they're found sink in. Wives, submit to your own husbands. How much so? As the church is to Christ, as he is the head of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, husbands, you're not left out by any stretch of the imagination. You're the leader. You're the head. You should be taking note of the fact that you must be a pretty good fellow in service to God because God expects your wife to be in submission to you. Husbands, love your wives. Well, how? how, how? Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Oh, what a challenge. What a challenge. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Well, that's interesting how he blends all this together because the church is the bride of Christ. Christ is the husband of the church. And in the home, the smallest, the largest, or the smallest entity of society, the role is for the wife to submit to the husband and the husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Now, where you don't have either one of those, you don't have things functioning right. If it's an eight-cylinder car, it's not running on all cylinders. They're not all hitting. So the striving, since he writes to members of the church, is that each one's doing their best to perform as a godly husband and a godly wife doing their part. And you've got a smooth running machine when it all is done like God wants. And you say, well, it's hard to submit. But listen to verse 28. So ought, underscore that word ought, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Now, when you've got a woman who is a godly woman, wanting to be what the Bible says a woman ought to be, then becomes a wife. And she looks at her husband this way, and there he is, a man who's become a husband. And he's looking at his wife in that way. Oh, they're going to make mistakes. When two people start living together, as husband and wife, there's going to be some times they're going to have to work things out. 
But he's giving guidelines as to where it ought to be. Each one has a responsibility to the other, and he tells you how it works. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones, speaking of the church. The church is to submit to Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Christ loved the church. The church obeys him. Now what about the home? The Christian home. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be for one flesh. Now he goes ahead and shows he ends up applying all of this to the spiritual bride of Christ, the church. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. But then he goes ahead, nonetheless, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is so important to recognize, and we're going to close here, because, you see, God did address the families, the husbands and wives, as to how they get along. I suggest when you've got people who are doing this, there's going to be times when one doesn't feel as good as another time, or one may have got up on some side of the bed and didn't even know they got up on that side of the bed. <laughs> uh, whatever, they're not, as Mama used to say, ill-tempered as an old cat. Well, sometimes that happens. You know why it happens? Well, walk up to a mirror and look real straight in and say, I'm a human. <laughs> That's why it happens. I'm a human, and I need the guidance of God to know how to be a human, to know how to be a man, to know how to be a husband, to know how to be a father, to know how to be a neighbor, knowing how to be a citizen, knowing how to be a Christian. And he tells us, I'm going to bring the lesson to a close here. There's plenty there to think about. As long as you live, there'll be plenty to think about. I remember when I told my grandfather, my mother's, mother that Joanne and I were getting married. He was 29 years old when he married my grandmother. She was nine years younger than he was. And he was never a Christian. He, never did. he was not a real talkative person. Oh, he'd talk with you, but he was few and far between. <laughs> he said, well, bud, I'll tell you like one old fella told me and I got married he said, you're taking a mighty big step, young man. He said, and you know what, bud? I'm still a-stepping. <laughs> and that's the way it'll be all your life, as long as you live together as husband and wife, joined together by God himself, Matthew 19, 6. Now, someday, people are going to give account for the way they took this in and let it guide their lives. This is just as much a part of the New Testament of Christ is Acts 2, verse 38, Acts 22, 16, or any other passage. God expects us as members of his church, his children, to put these things into practice. Well, are you going to be flawless in these things? No, because you see, you'll grow. You'll grow. Those of you who've been married a few years, you think you've grown any in understanding and in, at all? about being a husband and a wife. Think you have better insights than the way it was. Well, you think about that. But remember, as we quit this lesson today, all this was in your Bible before we ever started it, long before we were born in this world. But it'll face us at the judgment, just like everything else. If you're not a child of God, we would have to say to you, you're not walking in wisdom. You're walking in foolishness, and it's dangerous. I say dangerous because you don't know that you're going to have another opportunity to obey the gospel of Christ. You do have now. So the Bible would say today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. I ask you to be honest with yourself and with God. And with the truth you've known probably for a long time. And say, why will I delay? Why won't I put it off? Why not give your life to God and let him run the rest of your days? You can't live any better life than that. 
Because Jesus has already gone through life and blazed the trail. He's left us the truth to do the same thing. So you need to ask yourself the question, why when we offer the invitation, the lesson itself is encouraging to obey the gospel. You know God loves you. And you're being encouraged by people who love you to obey the truth. What is it that says, I am not going to respond to the gospel invitation? As a Christian, you can ask the same thing if you've wandered and slipped and slid and sinned. Why do you hold back and not repent? Confess your sins and pray God for forgiveness. But God has blessed us. He spared us this time. To obey the gospel if we need to. To be strengthened as faithful Christians. To be better. And if we need to be restored to our first love, to do that. So we ask you humbly to do so while we stand and sing.